Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog you will see my interview with Harry Lemon aka Lemonade about his classic Model 8. Enjoy! Lemonade is one of the projects of Dutch DJ and producer Harry Lemon. In 1993 Harry released a track which he called Model 8. This techno minimal production that came out on Basic Energy became a massive success in the dance scene. In 2006 it got re-released via Plus 8 Records, the label from Richie Houghton and John Aquiviva. Later Harry also released other successful tracks such as New York New York, Bells of Revolution and the bedrock classic Lose Control. I recently sat down with Harry in his studio to ask him about the story behind Model 8, his future plans and more. My first question to him was how old he was when he became interested in dance music. Uh, from a very early age, I think I must have been. Uh, well, not that early actually. First, I was into rock and roll and country music, <laughs> and uh, uh, my my love for dance music started with, as with most Dutch DJs, uh, Ben Libras uh, is in the mix. That was at two o'clock at night. So yeah, that, that really got me started into even thinking about making music myself. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the start. So do you also remember some of the tracks that you really liked a lot back then? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bad with names even today. But I heard, it's the first time I heard like Georgia Moroder. Yeah. And uh, the I Feel Love mixed by Patrick Cowley. Um, Bobby Orlando. Uh, it, it was the electronic stuff that, that really uh, hit home with me, yeah. That, uh, yeah. So was this also around the same time you started to produce music yourself? Uh, no, that came later. Uh, I, I did make music for myself, just for myself, uh, with like a, an old school tape recorder, four track tape recorder. I had like a band with two other guys, we both had keyboards and synthesizers. And we just played live and it was horrible. I still have tapes from it. <laughs> um, uh, but um, the first time I was thinking, the first time I, I was thinking of, about making music was uh, I think 1992, 1991. Yeah. yeah. And what was your very first release ever? Uh, Touch Somebody. Touch Somebody, I have it here. So this one. The first release, um, but I didn't produce it myself. I did. I did uh, one mix that I did myself, um, and I call it call it. I think the sweet and sour remix. <laughs> but yeah, but but I I don't count that as my first re first production because I I, I I I never produced a record before so so yeah, yeah. so you, you got some help back then no no yeah. I, I just did it and it sounded okay oh, and it was released like that yeah, yeah. so uh, you started to release music under the alias uh, Lemon 8 uh, and yeah Lemon is your real surname right yes it's yeah. it's my real name yeah that's yeah. a pretty cool surname yeah I once spoke uh, I once talked to a journalist from DJ Magazine uh, a long time ago, and he 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 thought I was making a joke or kidding him. He said, "Now nah, tell me your real name." I said, "It is Lemon," and I said, "It's British, so you know you should have heard of it." Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's my real name. Yeah. So in uh, 1993, you released the track uh, Model Eight under your Lemon Eight alias. Um, is there anything you can tell about the production process of this track? Uh, well, well, it started out as a remix for uh, a record called uh, Navigator, <laughs> which most people know from that time. Um, the Tellurians. The Tellurians. Yeah, so uh, I was asked by uh, CISO Records at the time, or maybe a sub-label, I don't, I don't recall. But uh, uh, that Model, Model 8 was... Um, uh, meant to be a remix of, of Tellurians. Uh, so I took out the Navigator samples after four months. I heard nothing back from the label, so I thought I'll just release it for myself. And uh, so that's what I did. But before I release it, I also made uh, a remix of my remix, which was the Lemonade remix <laughs> of 
of Model A. And, uh, and that's what's on the label. It's, it says Lemonade Remix on the B-side. And it's always been like a white label. But, but that's, that's the story of, uh, from... Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, what kind of equipment did you use for Model 8? Uh, I, I think it was a cracked version of Cubase uh, 1.01. I used uh, a 909. Um, the Pew Pew sound is from an Oberheim Matrix 1000. Uh, the bass is from uh, Juno 106. And then uh, I used the S1000 sampler from Akai. And that was for... Um, um, well, the, the, the acid sound came from there because I didn't have a 303. <laughs> and it's funny because people call it uh, like an acid classic, but it's not. Well, it is because that sound is in it. But it's, it's, I sampled it from a, a Loops and Samples uh, album, final mm -hmm. record. Uh, the, and the, um, the, the break beat that's underneath it, uh, the loop, is from that same record. Okay. And so that came out of the Akai. Yeah. So what was the hardest part of the production? Just to figure out stuff, because this was my first ever production. I, I locked myself up in the studio. I was I was playing uh, uh, at Night Town, the club where I was resident DJ. Uh, I had my techno Thursdays and Saturdays too. Uh, I played a lot of techno. And um, I went after the gig uh, in Night Town. I went to the studio like six o'clock in the morning and I spent all day recording this uh, uh, and, and so that, that's how it all happened. It was just after a gig getting in the studio and I was focused on, on, on the night that I played because it was, these nights were really good and I wanted to make something with uh, the remix, uh, something that was uh, targeted at, at, at my crowd at the basement. Yeah. And uh, so I, I tried it out a few times because I played a lot at, the, at that time and uh, in night time. And so I did some test runs and, uh, and, and that was it and then it was finished. Oh cool. So uh, do you remember how long it took you to finish the entire track? I think, I think it was just a day or a night, yeah. maybe a day and a night. Yeah. I, um, it's a long time ago, but uh, yeah, it was, it was finished really quick. So uh, after the release of Model 8, it got picked up by people such as uh, Kevin Saunderson and also Richie Halton, uh, who put it on his uh, X-Mix 3 compilation. Uh, do you remember who else played it? Many people. Uh, the thing is that the, at the time, you didn't have the feedback that, that you have now. So like the Kevin Saunderson story was, was funny because years later I heard that, that he, he was looking for that record and that he paid 500 euros or guilders, I don't know, <laughs> for it uh, somewhere in uh, I think Austria, something like that. Uh, those are funny stories. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I think everyone played it, but I heard that like years later. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. there was not really internet, so yeah. Yeah, there was no internet, so, well, the, there was a little bit of it, <laughs> you know, with the strange beeps and sounds, yeah. but uh, but yeah, it, it was like uh, you sent this out into the world and then uh, hopefully your child will send a postcard, like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine, daddy, I'm yeah. doing fine, I'm being played by Richie Holti, yay! So you, you got to meet Richie, right? Yes, I, I was... Um, he played it in Night Town where he was a guest uh, together with John Aquaviva and at that time he had this Plus 8 label and uh, uh, he played at Night Town and, and he had, he because Moto 8 had like uh, several different colors, red and see-through, marble and he collected them <laughs> and he had them with him, all, he had them with, with him and I had to sign them for him <laughs> and he said it was the best record he's ever heard and I said well you know you're kind of an inspiration for this you know but um, but after that uh, he contacted the record company uh, because he wanted to release it for uh, X mix the series um, and then they were going to have a presentation in uh, Berlin 
and I was invited to go there. Uh, they had video clips and everything, and uh, uh, the club was called AVAC, and it was it was it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet. Um, so, what's your favorite memory when it comes to the release of Model Eight? I just uh, because it was my first production, my first real production. I was just happy to play it, that I made something and at the, that year I made two records, two records that I really wanted to make. One was like a, a, a techno record, like this one, like Molo 8, and the other one was, a to was totally different. It was a funk record called Lemon Funk and it contained three tracks which was became big in Italy, just for funk, down to 100 beats per minute on my own Rise and Shine sub-label. So my memory for uh, going to Model 8 is also this period that I, I thought I was done after making this. This was like, well, okay, I made the two records I always wanted to make uh, since I was sm small. So I've done that and now I'm gonna be a DJ for the rest of my life and, and I'm done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, Model 8 came out via Basic Beat Recordings, a label in a record shop in Rotterdam. Uh, did you already work at Basic Beat yourself as well around that time? Yeah, it, it all it was all at the same time. I was working at the record shop, and so I had access to the studio, which was downstairs. So if it wasn't for the record shop, I would probably never have made this uh, record. Um, but it was also it was like this connection, Nighttown, Tinseltown Records which was the before basic beat the Tinseltown record shop and then the basement underneath uh, for music so it, it just came together like that yeah. and a lot of people that are now pretty famous uh, came there as well right uh, at the record shop yeah uh, yeah 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 it was always like yeah everybody came there but at the time that street the Nieuwe Binnenweg in Rotterdam was uh, it was the, the worldwide was the street with the most record shops and not just record shops but import records like uh, yeah I think we had like eight or nine and everybody visited and uh, international DJs too so, yeah. Yeah. so Chester was your colleague right I worked with Tiesto uh, yep side by side um, I was there when he uh, bought his first new car <laughs> I was there to console him when he was lovesick. <laughs> we were friends. Yeah. We were friends. And after dinner, we uh, uh, after after the shop, we went to dinner. And uh, I, I I think I was one of the first to ask him to play outside of Breda uh, in my techno basement. And uh, a funny story is uh, he was so nervous that he played all night with just his headphones on. Didn't look up once. <laughs> Very shy, very nervous, and very, uh, but very cool yeah. because he played uh, techno at the time and he played it very well. Yeah, nice guy. Yeah, cool. Um, so later you also started your own label, uh, Bandung, back in 2003. Uh, can you tell a bit more about that? Um, yeah, well, uh, basic beat was done, uh, and I was. Uh, I I don't really know how I got what the first contact was, but I think it was, I think Armin just called me. Um, and Armada just started out. It was, I think it was just uh, me, Marcus Schultz, Armin, uh, Perry O'Neill, uh, and, 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 and a few others. But uh, yeah, it was just, uh, Armada was just starting out and everybody was like, uh, uh, filled with enthusiasm and uh, yeah, we just came together like that. Yeah, yeah. Ah, cool. So you also started releasing uh, the Inner Sanctuary EPs and you also used the name for several of your mixes and remixes. Uh, is there a specific reason why you did name them like that? Yeah, I guess so. Um, it's more like something from within. It's just uh, the my inner part and it's it's a sanctuary. It's it it. I see making music as a and DJing too as as a spiritual thing, and uh, you know uh, there's there's nothing and and you have to make something out of nothing and the only place where 
where it comes from is from the heart or mind or some somewhere inside of you and uh, so that's why I call it that. Yeah, okay. Um, so you're also responsible for tracks such as uh, Belt of Revolution, uh, New York, New York and Loose Control. Uh, recently Loose Control got voted as all-time best bad rock release. Um, how, how did you feel when you found out? <laughs> I was very surprised because I thought that uh, label boss John Digweed would win it himself with Heaven Sent. Yeah. I mean that that is the ultimate progressive trance house classic and uh, so um, I thought that was the one who would, that would win it uh, so I was kind of embarrassed when I won it because I was like okay but at the same time I was just very honored uh, because I didn't expect it I uh, yeah, it's it's like a title you can wear, a, a crown you can wear in your head. It's, yeah. uh, but you know, it's it's a moment in time. Uh, I like it that the fans chose it instead of a magazine or whatever. Uh, so it's true. But uh, if you would have that contest next year or over uh, ten years, ten years later, uh, somebody else would win. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I take it with a grain of salt, but I'm still very proud. Yeah, of course, and you should be. Yeah. So, uh, did Bad, Bad Rock ask you straight away if you could uh, work on some new material for them? Well, not really like that, but um, I'm, I'm like, this is the only, I only recorded one track for Bedrock, so why not a second and do it again? I mean, you know. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. So, um, what else are you working on right now? Uh, lo uh, lots of remixes and uh, lots of originals, uh, but you know, the remixes as deadlines, so yeah. that's what I'm, uh, yeah, that, that's, that takes the most time. But um, I like it. Um, not because you have ready-made material, but just because um, you, you you meet new artists. Yeah, I, uh, this is my way of collaborating because I cannot collaborate with people making a record, but I can remix it. Yeah. So. So you're working on a lot of originals as well. Yeah, lots of originals, but you know. Um, I have like different setups of tracks that I need to finish, um, but once I uh, get started, it, it most of the work is inside the head. Mm -hmm. So you're, I'm always thinking about uh, uh, music. So in my head, it's finished already, mm -hmm. which is also <laughs> a bad thing. But um, that's how it works with me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And th those will be lemonade releases. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it will be lemonade. Um, so besides producing, you're also DJing. Um, how, how old were you when you started with DJing? <laughs> um, it depends how you define DJing, but I started playing music for others with a turntable and a cassette deck when I was seven years old. Oh, wow. In church. Huh. <laughs> we had a boys club at church, so I, I often refer uh, to me as the uh, the Whitney Houston of DJs. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad used to bring um, me with with some equipment. Uh, I, I recorded from the radio, and I had some real records, and that's what I played. Um, and uh, I did that every month from seven till sixteen. And when I was sixteen, I went to a youth center, I became a DJ there, which I did like every week, every two weeks, and that's that's how it started. So okay. I've, I've been. A DJ for all my life. <laughs> so, uh, what, what are your thoughts on the progressive house scene these days? I love it. I think it's uh, it's it's back where it should be. Uh, and then I'm talking about uh, the the music, the the way it's produced. Uh, there's um, uh, it's like a resurgence of uh, the quality music we had like 20 years ago. Uh, it never died, but um, it became formulaic. So now it's back to open-minded, groovy house music with influences from everywhere, and that's that's what progressive is about. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can make progressive music or regressive music, and now it sounds progressive again. Yeah. 
So, so is music a full-time job for you now? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, it hasn't been for a little while because I was uh, sick of the business around it and all this uh, stuff. I, I like music, I don't like the business around it, but it's, it's part of it and uh, I've learned from it and uh, I've grown wiser and uh, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to do this full time again. Yeah. And you're very inspired, right? I am, I am. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I don't know why. I, I, I mean, things just come together, you know, it's life. Yeah, yeah. So is there still something on your bucket list, music-wise? Well, not really, because I, I'm, first and foremost, I'm a DJ, so I like to play. And we all know that these days, and even 10 years ago, yeah, or 20 years ago, you have to make music to get around, to mm -hmm. get the, you know, um, so people will get to know you. Yeah, to spread the word. Yeah. yeah. It's marketing. Yeah. Uh, music is your flyer when you're a DJ. Yeah. Um, and I've often said, like, I, I, can, I can do without making music for the rest of my life, but I cannot do without DJing. And because sometimes music, and maybe it will sound strange to people who, who really like my sound, but sometimes it's like, um, I mean, when I when I when I make music, I really I, I go, I, I really make music, but uh, it, you you cannot compare it with DJing, and I've always been a DJ, yeah. so uh, I, I'm just lucky that I have talent for producing uh, dance music. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not underestimating it, but uh, I, I always call it it's it's like a, it's like a shaman thing. So you know you're the medicine man. So you uh, you're all by yourself. This is a this is a lonely thing. Making music is a lonely thing. Uh, so I make music. I go in my teepee. I put all the stuff together to make this magic potion. I lock myself up, and then after a week I come out, and then it's time for the whole tribe to dance and celebrate something. And I put on my mask and I have my stuff and I make them dance with the drums. Yeah. And that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. So there is a connection with DJing and producing them. And I think to me that, that that's my connection. That's how I relate to it. Yeah. That's how I see it. Yeah. I like the way how you describe that. <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah. So, and the last question, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Ah, uh, why not? Uh, why not? Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, yeah. So, thank you very much for your time and good luck with everything. You're welcome, thanks. Alright, that was it, this week's vlog. My interview with Harry Lemon, aka Lemonade. Harry, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below and make sure to subscribe. Once again, thanks for watching and until next time, bye bye.